I know it's hard to get away from chatting up colleagues, but here we are talking about budget and tenders. We know that um, public safety is priceless. You can't put a price on a person's life. Um, and when an emergency hits, all stops go. At least that's what the citizens expect. They don't want to hear afterwards about you know, budget limitations. Uh, but here we have three experts talking about, uh, first, uh, Gregor Janin. Is that close enough? What's the value of the call for life? Uh, from uh, 112 in the Balkans, Disponet. And then Luca Bergonzi from um, Beta 80 Group, Expectations and Reality in Technical Requirements. And finally, we have Andrew Watson, Global Government Industry Expert with Huawei, or Huawei or something. Public Safety as a Service. And so over to you, Gregor. Okay, good. I think I need the clicker. Yeah. Okay, it's already on. Um, yeah. What's the value of life, or what's the call of life value? Um, it's priceless, as we already said, but uh, we still have to think. So for those which don't know me by now, um, I'm quite long around in the public safety business. Uh, so 40 years of fire service, 38 years of uh, emergency medical service. So I went all the chains through from the beginning on. And for the last uh, 10 years, I'm quite pitching around between the organizations, as you can see, uh, and advising them on different topics. Um, we will talk about budget. So the, what we need, but we never have. Uh, we talk about capital expenses, which is one time problem to find it, and also the operational expenses, which are going to be everyday pain to find the money. We can go for managed service in this, uh, or we go on rentals and we pay as you go again. Everyday pain. Still, whatever I say here, that's my opinion. Don't nail me. You can nail me down, but don't nail anyone else down. Uh, and uh, quite things maybe a little, little bit confrontative, but uh, it works. So, um, the entry quiz. We have, we buy command and control centers. So how much do we really invest, capital investment, on the center, like infrastructure, hardware, software, uh, in order to get it running, the citizen served. And how much does one seat in a command center cost? So what do you expect? Like for the first one, how many we have for A? How many for B? C? D? Oh, we have a couple for the D, so. <laughs> and uh, for the seat, again, how much we have for the A? Don't see many. B, the C, and the Ds also still. Well, just to inform you, you're all right. <laughs> and that already shows the first thing is how is it possible that we're serving one citizen for 1.5 euro and the same, same service, basically, for 200 euro? Um, I made a short comparison. Those data are free from the net. so. It's not really uh, down to the last cent, but we are pretty good there. So if we go to New York City, 1.8 milliard. Okay, they made a little bit of mismanagement, but still, that's a lot of money. And then we have this high effective one, and then we have uh, those German uh, Kreisleitstelle, little districts, 200,000 people, 26 million euro. Well, how does it come? And we now have this Berlin New, which is a very new project, started with like around 80, uh, 80, 80 million euro at the beginning budget. Now we're at 185. Someone says they will go up to 160, uh, 260. So that's already, they have around 120 seats as far as I found out. So they are already ranging in the, in the top. So um, how comes that we have for the same service, for the same thing, such a big gap? Um, and whose fault it is? Well, let's see who is in for the budget. We have the good, the bad, the ugly, and the cat for sure. Let's see who is the good one. Of course, it's the 112 service. We, as 112 service, like to provide the best service to the citizens. We 
but we also have also to please the politics at some point. So yes, we make a small dispatch center, even we know exactly we don't need it. We could do it remotely. And we have, of course, some of the 112 servers are still blue-eyed, like Clint Eastwood. Uh, not to say naive, but naive also has some positive points. So they go into a project and say, yeah, we're making a new 112 center and we want the best. And then they're coming to the bad. That's the industry. Okay, don't take it serious, but they optimize everything for the sales number because that's their task, their industry. Um, and as all of the 112 which went through tender procedures know, they promise the hell. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Yes. Then it comes to the delivery. Ah, maybe a little bit. Can we do it like this? Can we? So at the end, there's quite a gap. Or you have a lot of work to do to get it there. And some of the companies which step into the public safety market, they're not really aware of what we are facing, what public safety means. We have seen the big names in the last years. Microsoft, they're not here anymore. Siemens, they're not here anymore. Uh, IBM, gone. So at some point they find out that those big numbers on sales, ah, I sell one cent of 10 million euro, that there's a lot of effort. The Frequentist guys knows that. They know exactly what the effort is. Avaya knows that by now. You know, you guys have, you have paid your tribute on that and you know exactly how much project management, how much effort is in there. So it's not fast money. Public safety is not fast money. That's why there are bad ones in the industry, but they are not here anymore, most of them. And yeah, we have the ugly ones, consultants. Um, it gets ugly on one point if you don't have one, because they're useful for something, but they're also ugly on the other side, because they are those consultants which listen to you and they pick everything and they make a fat tent out of that. Those are the ones, as a uh, friend of mine did say yesterday, it's like they take your watch, tell you the time, and charge money for that. So be careful. And then there are other consultants which tell the truth, but they piss you off. You don't want to hear the truth. You don't want to hear that you don't need those pink seats. Uh, you don't need 25 lines. So how to choose a consultant? So it, it's always getting ugly with them. And, uh, well, we have the cat. I don't know who is aware of Schrödinger, that's another Austrian guy, um, some physician which uh, had a crazy idea to pick a cat and some poison in one box. And as long as the box is closed, everything is fine. The cat is alive or the cat is dead. We don't know it. Um, same here. Industry, consultants, and also the uh, 112 guys, they come and say, ah, we have big budget. We want to make the big 112 centers. Bring us everything until you see the money. Also for the 112, the government says, you will get 10 million or EU delegations. My best friends, they say, IPA 5, whatever. You get 5 millions. And it's IPA 22 money. IPA 22 means you get the money in 25. So it's not money now. So until you see the money in cash, don't believe anyone. The cat is dead or alive. You don't know what it is. And uh, yeah, my most favorite five nine cat. We pack our command and control center with double, triple, five. Today in the morning I did here Atos. They have some um, uh, server sites with eleven nines, whatever that means. Um, and you pack it in one box, together with the telecoms, together with wide net area network, together with the connection between your cell phone and the base tower. And what's out of those five nines you're investing in your center when you put it together? And then one box, you don't know who is failing first. You, the other one. And so that's why I see it as one of the big cost drivers also. Um, the magic fives. If you hear the news about failing command and control center, you don't hear command and control center failing. It's most of the time out of your area. Not where you are able to interfere, where you can play some. We have, uh, the Universal Service Directive is very nice, but it binds you to one provider, one telco provider. If that one fails, you're out of service. If this one 
public safety network on the radio system fails, you're out of service. You have no backup. So why are you doing these five nines? We have cell phones out there, 99% of the population, which means on the other side, 69% of coverage on the field usually. We have the telco core, three nines if we are good. And then we have five nines, they're in series. And each nine we are investing moves the zero, the comma, one step. So it makes it 10 times more expensive. You say, I want the center, server center with three nines. Yeah, you get it for 100,000. You want five nines. You all of a sudden at 10 million maybe because it makes it drastically up. And again, there are some industries which are, have no lines between. I always like, again, forget these guys, air traffic control. It's you, the command center, and the, and the plane. There's nothing between you. They are, then you keep your five nines. The five nines you're producing, you keep them, and there's a reason for that, why you have to have it. But do we need it when they're destroying it anyway? It's a question, by the way. Um, and then we have always these CAPEX, op OPEX models. We hear today a lot of presentations get those uh, pay as you go, uh, command center as a service, software as a service. Uh, how we do it? Um, in Central Europe, um, we still split small centers as political favor. Yeah, the mayor goes to the district boss, says, yeah, but you know, my fire service, they need their own command center because he wants to have something to touch. Police, I need my command center. And it's a power game also. Me, police, well, I can't go over there and work together with the fire service. That's completely different. So we have a competition. The cities, the regions, they know always the, the killer argument, yeah, but you don't know where this farmhouse is. You, when you're sitting in Berlin, how you can say somewhere in Saxony where this farmhouse is? Bullshit, we have systems like that. Um, they're depending on the, on, on the government cycle. You have left-wing party, you get the money. All of a sudden, they change to right wing. All of a sudden, you don't see any money anymore. And uh, you have a very long planning cycle in Central Europe. We did here today. We started planning in 2018, started implementing in 2021. And really, the detailed planning, so detailed planning, detailed design starts many years before we even start. And this gives us, of course, the technology moves on nowadays. We, we're using Tetra system. We've contracted with a Tetra, which last millennium technology. And we have contracts which puts us for the next 30 years binding us on that technology. So we can't be flexible on, on system like that. And uh, yeah, so let's see at the five nines. Are we really have this isolated air traffic, just me and the plane? Or are those have those games between where I have to think about how uh, I can reduce my costs? And coming on the CAPEX, CAPEX things, uh, I always say blackmailed from politics. Uh, if you, as mayor, don't pay for my five call takers, then people will die in my city. And we know in Central Europe we have this volunteer system, which is a very good system, but they make the mayor or they kill the mayor. If they say, we don't like you, they talk to the wives, their kids, and the mayor is off duty. So that's why I say blackmailed from politics. I need my budget. But in the end, the cities have to pay for that. Or the citizens, let's say this way. Now looking how it is in the Balkans. We only have this one time shot. We get donations from World Bank, European Union, USAID, Chica, whatever. They are competing against each other, but it's a one time money. So and you have to prepare them. There's a lot of politicals before that. So you're running around checking who can give me what money, on which reason, how do I fit in different uh, funding projects in order to get my budget. And then I have a very short implementation period. Once the money is here, then it's fast. So there's more, as we have it in Central Europe, we have this technology problem to keep on like with implementing old technology. Well, in the Balkans, we have the advantage to have very new technology. And it shows that all of the implementations nowadays in the Balkans are way, way more advanced technology-wise than those classical old-style systems uh, as we have in Central Europe. 
in the Balkans, no one talks about ISDN. I was there starting like 15 years ago. I said, you know, a little bit more than two megabit would be fine. And they said, how much bandwidth you need? How much fiber optic? We have fiber optic here, 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 here. It's like, oh, you have fiber optic? So really things which are, for us as Central Europeans, not uh, um, clear. So, but then it comes to the OPEX. There is no OPEX. There is no one to give you money for the maintenance cost. So if you drive the CAPEX up there, it's 20% every year, the op usually maintenance costs. That's what it is. And if you say the system will cost you 20 million, you have 4 million each year. No one has the money down there. So we have to think about, especially in the Balkans, what we offer there. It must be everything included in the CAPEX. Later, nothing comes. And the human resources, we talked about quality management. Um, down there, there's no quality management possible because you get what you have to take because those are voters. And usually, um, let's say this way, the smart ones in the family, they come to the customs service. Little bit less smarter ones, they go at least to the financial offices and the last in the row, that's public safety because there's nothing to get. You get your salary and nothing else. So you go there for sleeping and you have a second job in order to survive. So you, you can't really pick the best. And you have to take those which the government gives you because those are voters. A system which is uh, hard to understand, but that's the way it is. We will not change it from one day to the other. And of course, we also government cycle depending. Um, government cycle depending, it means down there that even the cleaning lady gets changed. So. So, and now how we can solve the Balkan issues? No more feasibility studies. We've done them over and over again. They're nice money, nothing to say, but technology is standardized nowadays. We have commercial off-the-shelf products. We can define those, we say we want those products. The only thing what you have to define now is how you want to operate it, how you want to work it. Um, one thing what we have to address them when we give them money in the Balkans, stop using voters to fill up positions. Um, and one thing where I still fight for OPEX is that the quality management get protocols. We have countries where we see that. Georgia, Georgia implemented priority dispatch. And it's also kind of South country. They made it possible to say we are taking 500,000 euro, euro each year for our quality management because they know it pays off. Standardization, quality management pays off in the long run. But this is very hard. Um, better is to find outsourcing model. We see it in Sweden, SOS Alarm, Finland, all those really high professional centers, they're outsourced. Government owned outsourced centers where you can really work, where you can um, try to get some business done. And uh, this would be one of the goals. I'm trying all the time to say, guys, let's create a profit center and make it there. Uh, but in the near future, we have to stay on the OPEX models. So to the industry, the consultants, you have a one-time shot. If this shot fails, you have to wait for your next chance, three to four years, till you get a phase two, a phase three maybe. Um, how can we still reduce the costs? Um, my, my heart is always with the three GPP evolutions and how, why, how can I even more reduce my hardware? This is just one thing. This is from 2009, a friend of us uh, from Fraunhofer Institute did this. Why do I still have my own PPX? I said before, the biggest failures are within the telecom network. Why don't I connect my client directly? It's the same thing. I just have to be sure that I'm prioritized. But I can't be connected there and they hand the call directly. I have the advantage of having the radio network included. So this is a thought for the future, how to reduce the costs. And like I said, those which say it's not possible should not stop those which are doing it already. It's already running out there. There are countries which are already running on uh, mission-critical LTE systems. Um, we have to reduce our costs, we have to reduce our investments. Um, so the conclusion, we have to face the game. 
good, bad and ugly, they will still stand dual each other. But we have to focus. We have to see, look in the eyes, what is the other one doing? And choose the right tool. If you go into the fight, let's say this way, be prepared. The 112 center, be honestly to the industry, be honestly to consultants. Consultants, say honestly what the customer needs from your perspective. You have the experience, you have run around, you see other countries, you did know where they fail. Don't make them believe just you want to keep your job for the next 10 years. I usually always say, if I'm out of the, there as fast as possible, they can run autonomous, that's the best job I can do. Don't stick with them. Um, or you think the five nines. Yeah, are they really necessary? And which point are they necessary? In which elements? When we put them in one line with all the other ones. Yeah, and of course, don't trust anyone. And, but live and let live, so it's, it's a give and taking. If you, if you bite the other one, he's not gonna take you again. And yeah, the cats are still an asshole. Doesn't matter how it is. You don't know which element of your system will fail. Uh, and it will fail, we all know that. Uh, so try to be aware of it, be prepared for it but don't overinvest in your protection, you know? Protect yourself, protect yourself. Like I said, uh, the sheep is, aware, uh, is, is afraid of the wolf all his life and gets eaten by the, the shepherd at the end. So be clear where are your problems and if it pops up, but don't overinvest. Um, yeah, so Schrodinger's catch is alive and very, very angry. So it, failures will happen. So trust in your, as the 112 guys, trust to your, uh, to your companies that they will protect you for not failing, but evaluate. Um, oops, other direction. So that's about it. Um, yeah. Well, thank you, Gregor. Good, I'm out. Thank you, sir. <laughs> yeah. But on time. Okay. Directly. Yeah, Luca, you can go now. Over to you. Okay. <coughs> Thank you. Okay, so uh, as Gregor uh, has touched already a very itchy argument, now we are going into the nightmare of technological vendors, the technical requirements <laughs> of a tender. So let's take a look at what's out there, the expectations of uh, public safety entities and the reality, you know, what can be provided and so on. Public tenders are made of different parts, uh, administrative requirements, technical requirements and economical quotation. The core, let's say from a vendor perspective, of course, is to be capable of satisfying the technical requirements. And uh, let's go anyway through all of them. So uh, administrative requirements, in, I've, been, I've been working on several tenders, more than I can count. And uh, you know, the expectations on administrative requirements is always that the vendor has to prove exactly what I want to be developed in my own project. So I have 100 PSAPs, I have 1,000 operators, I want an example exactly like the one I want. Unfortunately, the reality is not like this. Countries are very different from each other, they follow different models. Some of them are centralized, some of them are regional based, so looking for exactly the same element I'm proposing in my own tender is really an utopian uh, requirement, it's my um, a wish list. So, it's better always to look around and see what's close to me in terms of size, population, in terms of procedure management, and so on. Uh, looking around, uh, it's the best way to understand where I could go and, and what eventually vendors can provide. You know? Looking for a, a copy-paste or a twin uh, model is really complicated. What about technical requirements? So, I want everything is the basically summary of every technical requirement document. 
I want everything. It doesn't matter if I need it or not, uh, if it's complicated to match or something, but this is the uh, expectation most of the times. But this is not the reality, unfortunately. No. So first of all, uh, the opinion, my opinion is to get familiar with the market. So what's out there, what can be provided? Usually a very well-structured um, market analysis is the best way to understand uh, what can be delivered in your own project and so on. So the awareness of what's there, it's absolutely important when defining your technical requirements. What's the situation in the market and so on. And also, a suggestion for, for, uh, for public safety entities, what is supposed to be our customers. Uh, keep Watch out for overselling, because like uh, Gregor said, the bad guys are always trying to be bad guys you know, sometimes. So a little bit part of overselling will be always present when you do a market analysis, but that's absolutely important when you want to understand what's out there. Um, what does the gap analysis say? So we are talking also about, uh, let's say, the requirements of your process versus um, what's out there. What are you missing? What is really needed? What is your pain points that you would like to be solved with a new solution that you are aiming for? So if you are capable, in my opinion, if you're capable of specifying these kind of things, uh, uh, you will get a very close solution to what your expectations are. Because asking for everything, sometimes it's just a matter of giving promises and eventually not fulfilling what you are really uh, looking for. And your, I mean, as a, as a vendor, a roadmap, a product roadmap or a solution roadmap is important, but also from the public safety perspective, a roadmap where this entity wants to go, what are, uh, they want to deploy, and not everything, of course, uh, the, the first day, but in time, it's important to be defined so that even vendors can understand how long do they have to reach your final goals and so on. Um, remember also you're dealing with mods and not cots most of the time, so not um, off-the-shelf software, but modifiable off-the-shelf. I have never seen in my life uh, a situation where I didn't have to make a, a single change in my um, so solution, the, the solution that our company proposes. Development activities has always been to be taken in consideration when um, defining a project or assigning a project to somebody. So, in principle, if you want to avoid that a vendor says yes to everything, just blindly to be uh, compatible with your requirements. Keep in mind, how do you evaluate eventually the gap that is honestly declared you know, in a document when it's possible to do so? Uh, how much do you consider a gap between the uh, elements that are required and the ones that are declared and so on and so on? So judging the gap, it's, uh, it's an important method to understand that somebody is not just saying yes because you want them to say yes to everything. And then, of course, you have to map your process. Uh, one of the best ways to understand um, <coughs> if the questions are posed in the correct way is to show them in your technical requirements. Why are you asking for such a requirement? Because I need them in this part of my process. So defining your process, the way you work, first of all, qualifies you as a particular um, subject to be dealt with. You're not just a generic entity publishing one of the thousand tenders that are out there, but you define your own specific requirements and why you need them, uh, what do you want to fulfill with these things, and so on. So the whys of your technical requirements are always important when you want to define a clever approach to the, to the vendors. Uh, security and resilience. These are also key factors that most of the times, I mean frequently, let's say, are underestimated. Um, a contact center is not made only of a PRBX, a CAD, a radio system, and so on, but now, even more than in the past, the security and resilience are key factors. So do not underestimate this part. Uh, consider that you may be absolutely uh, a target for cyber attacks uh, or that you may be <coughs> Uh, the victim of uh, system failures, network failures, and so on. So uh, this was also described very well by, by Gregor in his idea of the five nines and so on. You need to really understand at what level of resilience you want your solution to be put. Um, 
And cybersecurity is also a very important topic. We know that nothing is taken for granted and nothing can be <laughs> guaranteed at this point. Economical quotation, so let me put it this way. This is the final part. So after we have seen something about the administrative part and the technical one, then we have, of course, an evaluation of the, techni of the uh, economical quotation. So a, correction, a correct definition of budget will help you defining, in the end, what you can um, uh, be provided, what you can purchase, what you can achieve in the end with some uh, with the requirements you have. So uh, again, market research, in my opinion, so doing your homework and benchmarking, benchmarking before any tender process, any technical evaluation is um, written is a powerful tool to understand uh, um, what are your needs. I was also impressed by the numbers I saw, the difference between you know, same system or similar systems can range uh, and differentiate a uh, hundred times for, from one solution to the other, even if we are also always talking about the same goal. So it's serve the public uh, trust, uh, protect the citizens, and make sure that emergency are responded carefully. So it doesn't mean effectively that one solution has this precise cost. We deal, like I said before, with not with computer of the shelf uh, software, so you're not purchasing Windows uh, licenses or Microsoft Word licenses and so on. You're pro uh, purchasing a project. And the complication of the project, the complexity, sorry, of the project, the type of uh, software elements, hardware elements, uh, communication elements inside, they all depend on you and they all depend on the nature of your project. And everybody has a different uh, nature. So comparison, market research, and benchmarking more or less um, about the cost of this solution is very important. You see, I also mentioned the five nines. <laughs> so, <laughs> so technological uh, elements may be more expensive than you thought. The difference between uh, four nines and five nines is huge, even if there is only one nine of difference no, by looking at the, at the numbers. Um, do not squeeze prices. I know you always have to deal with budgets and so on, but then try to be realistic. What you want versus what you have in your budget. Because the problem is that if you squeeze too much, if you want too much from a, a vendor, and the vendor knows when you're squeezing, the, the final result will be a lose-lose situation, not a win-win situation. And in that occasion, you will get less than what you expected. You will have, for sure, conflicts and so on. So better asking for less and making sure that what you ask for is um, delivered properly. As a conclusion, so I already finished quite fast. Yeah. <laughs> So this is a really heterogeneous process. No? Every piece up, every contact center is for himself. They are very different from each other and so on. So let me summarize a little bit some suggestions that may match expectations with, with reality. Um, I, I've already said that before. Market research, that's very important because it gives you an idea of what's out there. Do not go blind and decide that you want that because you think it's the best thing in the world. Just see what the others have done. Um, it's best practices. There are already several um, other people that did it before you and so on. <clears throat> uh, get the help of a consultant, the, the ugly guys. Uh, the ugly guys, uh, the consultants um, are there. They know their stuff. They know what uh, they're talking about. And most of the times they help you, let's say, defining what you already know but maybe you're not able to put them on paper. Or at least they can give an interpretation of your needs. Uh, I'm not expecting that every single piece of every single organization can cover the full process end to end, understanding everything about every technology. So that's when the consultant comes in and, and may help. So uh, I've seen the difference, to be honest, between tenders written by consultants and tenders written by you know, self-made uh, experts. And I rest assured that there, sometimes the difference is very big. Uh, finally, I would say, <coughs> uh, do not make wish lists. This is not like a, you know like a Santa 
wish list that you want a present for Christmas or something like that. We are talking about uh, real things. We are talking about uh, understanding uh, what's out there and what are the possibilities of a, of a software or a communication platform. And not just software, I mean, we are CAD vendors, but of course we are talking about generally about everything inside the PISA. One of the interesting best practices I've seen, for example, is uh, instructing demos or proof of concept instead of just making long lists of requirements that in the end will be just a long list of yes. In that way, you may start assessing the capabilities of your vendors, understanding if they're really saying the truth, and until when, you know, they, uh, reality matches your expectations. So, in case you are capable of doing so, if your uh, laws, if, if your regulation allows that, Think about this, think about proof of concepts, uh, think about the way to test what you're going to purchase as when you're going to drive a, to, to buy a car, you ask sometimes for a you know <coughs> test drive or something you know, mm -hmm. to decide. And that's basically the conclusion of my discussion. Keep in mind that I know it's a very complicated process, so one single presentation cannot give all the ideas on how to build a tender, but from the vendor perspective and for all the tenders have seen. This is the summary of my suggestions to generate new and better written tenders, let's say, for the future. Thank you. Well, thank you, Luca. Uh, that was very <laughs> clear and concise. Um, any questions from the audience to either Luca or Gregor, you know, since they can share their question time? Uh, um, and no questions? Uh, there is a question right there. Yippee! <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you very much for the presentation, by the way, and for the insights, especially given the SLAs and the requirements from the SLA fulfillment point of view, and the five nines, being it four nines, being it whatever nines, 11 nines. My question would be, and especially everyone who is looking for a public safety solution, obviously always want to have it as much secure as it can be. And it's not even a question again anymore about five nines, it's, it's kind of how can it be 100% sure? And I think we all know that it cannot be five nines and it cannot be 99.99 .99, and there is no such 100% security in the network. Technologically, it's just not possible to build it, right? And if and it's all question of money, actually, when you build the SLAs. If you say it's 100%, you just cover a bucket of money behind, which can then cover for not fulfilling the SLAs. So my question is, how do you, as a consultant to the company, actually deal with that requirement when you say, okay, there is no five nines, there is no nines, but what is realistic? Um, we, we move it from the five nines and from the SLAs to the SOPs, the standard operating procedures. Cover, you must be aware, as you said, all the systems can fail, they will fail. So be prepared for the failure. Don't invest, over-invest that they won't fail. Be more realistic. Yes, it will go down. How can I handle the system when I'm down? And in the long run, you will be better because your stuff, you train those procedures. You shut down the system once in a while. I know a lot of centers which do that. And most of the time, those are the centers which uh, did not invest in the five nines. They make once a week shutdown procedure, unannounced, and see, is my quality decreasing, where I'm failing? Of course, they don't shut it down, so they're really failing, so they still have their back, back, back up where someone is sitting, but the other ones don't know that. So move it from the SLAs. You can't afford SLAs with these five nines on the long run, especially not the Balkans. Those are maintenance costs. Triple lines with fiber optics and parallel microwave links, seen it all, done it all, failed all. The, the, the caterpillar goes in the first trench. So, so you're saying as consultants, you do go out and manage the customer's expectations? Yes. That's why I'm the bad one. <laughs> that sounds very good. Is that answering Thank the you. question? But, but yeah, by the way, you also did you. see that uh, if the consultant takes a little bit longer, it makes for the industry easier to be faster. So define better, then they can be implement faster. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? We still have a couple of minutes. No, I think we are done with questions for now. So Andrew Watson. 
public safety as a service. Is that a cheap solution or is that the most expensive one? Um, I'm going to explain something that, um, and I fully reserve the right of anyone who is operational to start throwing things at me when they hear the proposal, right? What, we're, what I'm going to share with you is my experience now across the world. What I'm seeing in Latin America and Africa and the Caribbean and Asia, where you're looking at people tackling what we've seen and what's coming back is if the uniform doesn't need to do the job, don't let the uniform sit in a seat and do the job. Send them out to be a uniform. Now, I mean that in the sense of police, fire, or ambulance, or other emergency services, right? Now, you might say that's an incredibly naive thing. You need experienced people to take calls. You need experienced people to be dispatchers. You need... I know where you need experienced people, all right? Because I've done this. I've been all sides of this equation. I've built them, I've run them, and if any of my colleagues are here from either London Ambulance or the Met Police, you'll also know I'm an experienced call taker and dispatcher. I wasn't averse to spending a Friday night in the call centre as the CIO, as part of the executive team, right? Um, I'll very quickly cover something because I think we're a little bit ahead on time. Um, how do you write a specification? Do you want the CIO's guide to put a stop to the nonsense? All the operational people want they want the information they need to do their job, right? Therefore, every role has an information requirement. Where am I getting that data from? On the chain all the way. The people at the very top, they don't care how it works. They don't care supposing you sprinkle magic fairy dust on top of fruit. How it happens is irrelevant. They want it never to go down because it's politically intolerable and they want it to succeed on the high-level KPI of preserving and enhancing life. The problem comes in the middle, where the people that count things want to count in greater sophistication. And I always challenge that crowd to say, where is your requirement for counting against the operational need of information that those that do the job? And every time they come up with another feature, another requirement, another bit of GIS, geofencing, counting of something, or a new type of feature we're putting on the screen. Who needs it operationally? Not who needs it for their monthly report, but who needs it operationally, right? And my rule of consultancy, there are three rules for employing a consultant. One, they have an absolutely specialist skill or need that you do not have and cannot ever warrant hiring. Two, you need a set of resources to do a job that you cannot justify having in the long term. Number three, because I was told to hire them, the management said, get a report consultant in, they will write a report, they will give us that report, they will tell us probably what you're telling us, but they'll do it in a very big report and we'll take great confidence from that. It's the most frustrating thing in the world to spend public money on consultancy when you have all the skills in-house. Number one rule is the key one. Get the person that can really help you. Not the huge organisation, not the team, but those were my three rules as a I think reasonably experienced CIO, right? Those are my three roles. Anyway, moving quickly on. Um, the current position we've had articulated, and by that current position, I don't just mean the black and white imagery. I actually mean right now, there is an obsession in the public safety world to build our own, have our own control center. As, as you mentioned, the mayor that says, I've got to have my own control center because they want one. It's a kudos thing to have at any level of government to have your own method of managing public safety. Um, they, they want their own data centres. Sometimes they make this fallacious argument, salacious argument about um, it's to do with privacy, it's to do with security, it's to do with data sovereignty. Nonsense. Sorry, I was part of the UK government team that helped write some of GDPR and some of its amendments. None of that stacks up in Stan's analysis. My problem is, is I wear, have worn too many hats over the years for all these arguments. They want their own data centres. But as we've said, you can't afford five nines. 
I'm going to show you how you can afford seven nines in a minute. But you, you can't afford five nines. And you never achieve it. I know that. Previous slide. I've been there. Every year you produce the report. What was the uptime this year? 96%, 98%, 95%. You're not even getting two nines most of the time when you have your own. And then what do you have? You have lock-in. You explained the CapEx problem. I buy. I don't invest for improvement. So therefore, I'm using five years ago technology. And then it falls off a cliff and I need to replace it. So there is no continuous improvement cycle. There is gradual degradation, collapse, replace. That's the cycle in the public sector. And it, it's always been that way because you go begging for CapEx every five years once the depreciation runs out on your previous investment. Because you need to be an accountant to be a CIO. You need to speak finance to really understand how that works. And you have a high revenue cost because you need your own support engineers. You have a high capex cost because every time something breaks, you need to buy it if it's not covered in a maintenance agreement. And you do find yourself five years later with redundant hardware. Over that time, how has that been justified? Well, it's been justified because of this type of progression. You go back 40 years, doesn't feel, who, who, who thought I was going to say 20 years when I said 1980? I still do that. I still think 1980 is 20 years ago. But you go back to 1980, industry had nothing to offer for communications for data. And gradually over that time, varying degrees of flakiness have got more stable. And gradually technology has now got to the point where we've got 5G. 5G is a more stable communication platform than probably anything that has been offered in the narrow band world. Duck, waiting for the brick bats coming, right? It's true, the technology community, the industry has stepped past where public safety is and its requirements. They're now servicing needs of the population that are beyond the expectations of the public safety community. Where is your banking data? It's in a cloud. Where are your personal health records? They're in a cloud. Where's your CAD data? In that little room, at the side of the control room, managed by the guy called Fred that turns up Monday to Friday, nine to five, hopefully he's there when it breaks. Is that how you really want the protection of your citizens to be done. Now, I, I start presentations. I've done many presentations on replacing CAD systems and public safety solutions. And I always start them in the same way. If we get this wrong, people die. Never, ever, ever forget that. This isn't banking. This isn't commerce. This isn't the car for Tesco world, where you make a mess in the server room and the oranges don't get delivered today. You get this wrong, you take a CAD system down at the wrong time, ambulances don't get dispatched, people die. And I have no qualms about that, because I've been in enough police cars, as many of you have been, and ambulances, and I've seen what happens when it goes wrong in society, and we've got to go and try and pick that mess up. So I have no qualms about that. That's how the presentation starts. Get this wrong, people die. Um, so what are the services that we're starting to see being offered across the world? Well, call taking. Now, don't you need specialist call takers? How many times have I heard that argument? You can't outsource it. Impossible. They need to be specialist. Every year I address the new cohort of call taker trainees. And I used to go around the room. Where did you work before? Where did you work before? Where did you work before? Supermarkets, taxi drivers. And in six months, we turn them into call takers. But, so why does that have to be the police or the fire or the ambulance's job to train them? Why can't that be a service? Why is it the police's job to provide the uniforms and everything else? I don't buy the argument that call takers need to be seen as sometimes uniquely trained within a public safety organisation. Call taking can be a service. It's transactional. It's based on a decision tree. 
and it's not that complicated. Control rooms, there's many things under this, right? And this is where the uniforms rule drops in. How many times does the control room manager or the senior supervisors, for those that are in that part of the world, actually intercede in, a ca in an incident decision on a daily basis? How many of them are just dealt with? Call taker, dispatcher, officers attend, incident dealt with, incident closed. Where is the need for the command decision? How often is that required? Because the need for that intercedence is the reason that people make out that you can never have a service provided to you of dispatch. Now, I'm perfectly aware of the fact that there's, a, there's a million and one scenarios where that is required, but therefore reserve the officer intercession for where it is actually required. Clouds, storage, processing. Some of the vendors here today of CAD systems are quite happily and quite proudly, and they need to be proud, of completely rebuilding their CAD solution so that it's offered from a cloud base. That cloud base is a bit more stable than probably what you can guarantee for your own back-end staff. It also means that where you're starting to offer these processing capabilities across multiple forces, multiple um, organizations, you, every time you expand it, you, you bring the economy of scale. And there are actually some contracts I'm seeing where there is a guaranteed revenue reduction in charge for a scaling up of the use of the multi-tenancy agreement for the service that's been provided out of the cloud. So the more people that actually go into it, the more it comes down. Traffic management. Traffic management is very transactional. I started off my life as a civil engineer, so I know my way around the, the building, the designing, the manufacturing, the supervising of roads. And again, it's something that quite often in many countries is reserved into policing. But it's a transactional process. And the reaction is when there is an accident, but if you manage the traffic better, you can sometimes avoid the accidents because you put the traffic management solutions in place when you see the traffic build up being different. Commercial integration. Police services don't like being seen as some kind of extension of security of commercial premises. But who's got the money? Who will pay for the commercial service of security, of camera monitoring, of making use of the public cloud processing on facial recognition, which can be done as a service, and it's perfectly feasible to do it within the confines of GDPR by restricting the output point to only on a need-to-know basis. So now all of a sudden I can start to do all my societal monitoring of people that I want to keep an eye on as a service without it touching the police. And what they find out is when you get the hit. And they control the input and they control the algorithms. So there is, but they don't carry the overhead. And communication networks. Now, most communication networks have a carrier or an air services provider in there somewhere, but that world's changing. And I'll show you why in a minute. Why is that happening? It's all money. It's straightforward. We had the CapEx, OpEx discussion earlier. What you're looking at here is mostly sunk investment being recycled and offered out as capacity for providing services. Therefore, you, the public safety organization, and this is, I say, what I'm beginning to see across the world from carriers and cloud providers, there is no CapEx. CapEx is gone. It's all OpEx. And the more people that are in the OPEX world, the more the cost comes down on economy of scale. Now, I've seen numbers all over the place, so I'm not going to quote a number to you. All I'm going to say is, on the whole, the OPEX cost of outsourced services being offered back is less than the OPEX cost of running it internally with the depreciation cost of the capital investment allowed for as well. So the OPEX is lower and there's no capital? That's challenging. It's challenging to the public safety world who are finding this conversation uncomfortable that all of a sudden they don't have a call centre, 
their dispatching centres have a lot less officers in them than they used to, and what they're getting is as a service. And they're bringing real professional decision making to the incidents and to the environment where it's really required. Um, commercial service management. We're going to go on the nines here, but I'm going down a completely different road to where everybody else went. Right? You want a con control center. What's the standard model? Five nines. Roughly five minutes a year downtime. Right? My view as a CIO, anyone tells me anything above five nines, it's their marketing or their legal people won't let them say 100%. Because five minutes a year is on five nines, six nines is about 30 seconds a year, um, seven nines is about three seconds a year downtime. Anything above five nines, it's 100%. Right? But when you move everything out to a cloud, everything, and you get single vendor technology chains, right? So you have a um, dual cloud, active, active, AI managed, fault tolerant data centers connected with photo optical cables and diverse routing. That all sounds hugely expensive. That's how the carriers actually build their networks. What does that mean? You don't have five nines, you have seven nines. And that's not seven nines measured at the server, because that's where the five nines is measured. The five nines is measured at the server. Seven nines, I'm seeing that being offered as a service to the nearest network access point. So if there's a wireless connection in here, the seven nines, you can commercially request it to be seven nines to the access point. They won't do it to the device because the devices are just far too complicated for people buying rubbish and the device is the problem. But you can get seven nines to where you connect to the network as a service. And therefore the seven nines, five nines becomes a pointless discussion. Now we're talking about MTBF, mean time between failure. What's the mean time between failure of all the devices in the chain? If you look at the MTBF on many of the devices that are now coming out from the technology providers, the MTBF is longer than the expected lifespan of the product that you're buying, the solution you're buying. You'd expect to replace a CAD every five to seven years. Many of the solutions around storage and routing, the MTBFs are coming out at 10 and 11 years. You're buying product that's designed to last longer than the solution. So, what's the ease of offering these? Well, these three, these are pretty much available now. And they're not that complicated to roll out. Um, politically, I'm not going to say politically it won't be <laughs> as straightforward as it could be, because there will be a degree of reluctance to adopt some of them. These two, a bit more complicated, a bit of discussion to go on there, especially in the dispatching world. And as I say, if I was standing up here as a technology vendor and a career technology salesman, I would expect to be having things thrown at me by now. But the problem is, I'm a career CIO who's come into this world and I understand the challenge of that, but I'm seeing solutions that are real and viable. And then you get to the communications network. Now, vend many of the carriers already offer some services into this world. But what we're now seeing is there has always been a requirement to communicate to the device, technically to the officer on the end of it, be it paramedic, fireman, or police officer. And we know the narrowband world, that's easy. And we know the LTE network, and everybody's using the LTE networks, many are using them, we've got their dedicated LTE networks, and they're hugely expensive to build, putting up your towers and running your trunking, and quite often you're running the trunking down the same channel at the side of the road as the carrier is. We're now getting the stage where you can actually put LTE over carrier networks. That's a change. Now, I don't need the, the same dedicated trunked network. So, um, I'm going to have to shoot on because I'm taking too long on this. Everybody that does this needs a commercial mechanism to deliver it, and everybody wants a rock solid tied in contract. You make it standards based, GDPR, ISO 27001, you must meet these. The smart bit that's now coming out is some countries are starting to define what's called critical national infrastructure, not just as things, but as services. 
So you have CNI services. So when you write the contract, you're not referencing all these weird clauses that somebody internally dreamt up who thinks they're a contract manager. You're referencing CNI legislation that's saying, you, the CXO team of this company offering this service, now have culpable responsibility for failures. So this is forcing the community that are trying to invest or get something back from their sunk investment, they want that back. They, they can take it on, but they take it on with personal culpability at the CXO team. And this is proving to be quite an interesting discussion. So, very final slide. Uh, points for consideration. There are millions. These are my quick summary. Long-term financial model. At the moment, vendors are offering back sunk investment, spare capacity. What happens when they run out of sunk investment and spare capacity to sell cheap? You need to be asking that question if you're interested in this. Do you really understand trust models? Who do you trust? What equipment do you trust? And how do you rate it? This takes you into, strangely, GDPR, DPIA, privacy impact assessment models of the whole model. Corporate culpability, we've talked about. Reputational association, you can get yourself into bed with some companies that do things because they're commercial that can be a bit awkward if you're in government. Data and privacy, we've touched on, and legal issues. And I'll just leave you with one extract from one piece of legislation. You need to look for these, right? Where you have a piece of legislation that says, any crime is only a crime if it's reported to an officer and it's written down by a woman police officer. This type of legislation is the tripwire in there that you've got to really go looking for. And I'm really sorry, I think I have slightly overrun. Thank you very much, Andrew. Uh, unfortunately, we are out of time for questions, um, uh, but I'm sure you can flag him down during the coffee break in one hour. But first, uh, here in this room, there is the next session is preventing violence against emergency services which is sure to be interesting to most of you. Um, but then there is uh, cybersecurity also at the same time in the parallel track uh, room, uh, in the, uh, the number one room. And then there is the industry session in parallel track three. So uh, yeah, have a great one. <laughs>